National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture, presents U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having farmers receive cost of product plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization. U.S. Farm Report now presents Marketing Agency in Common with special guest Walter Geppinger, president of the National Corn Growers Association from Boone, Iowa. Mr. Geppinger is a graduate of the Iowa State University and has been engaged in farming for 36 years. He is also formation chairman of the United States Feed and Grain Council and is in the 10th year as president of the National Corn Growers Association. And Gordon Schaefer, chief negotiator of the National Farmers Organization from Kingsville, Missouri. And now, U.S. Farm Report. Mr. Geffinger, <clears throat> we are indeed delighted to have you as our special guest on this U.S. Farm Report. Uh, I understand that you're president of the National Farm Growers Association. I hear that you were also the first president of the Feed Grain Council. Would you care to make some remarks about your affiliation with these groups? Our National Corn Growers Association uh, is now in its twelfth uh, year. And uh, as a part of the work of the National Corn Growers Association, we uh, formed the U.S. Feed Greens Council in 1960. The uh, U.S. Feed Greens Council is the market development arm, uh, working in uh, 17 foreign countries through eight uh, international offices uh, scattered throughout the world. And uh, as such, we are interested uh, very basically in marketing the products of agriculture the same as NFO is. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you are a farmer. Uh, would you care to comment a little bit on your farming operation, more or less, as getting, getting acquainted here with our audience? Well, I can say that uh, my entire uh, well-being economically is tied to farming. I'm, as uh, you mentioned, in my 36th year of uh, a uh, Midwest corn farmer. Uh, we've uh, also been keenly interested in uh, the production of beef cattle through the years. And uh, my father ahead of me and my grandfather ahead of me out in central Iowa. Now I have my uh, son, my older son, with me in business. And I hope uh, when my younger son gets through his military uh, responsibilities, which he's just in the middle of now, uh, that uh, he can come back home and be part of the farming scene too eventually. Fine. I understand uh, that a few months ago you uh, joined the National Farmers Organization. I might also mention that our national president, Orrin Lee Staley, is a member of the National Corn Growers Association. Would you care to comment on why uh, you decided to join the National Farmers Organization, the NFO? Well, I believe that uh, the support of all farmers belongs with the uh, national general farm organizations that truly represent the farmer and uh, want to see to it that he gets a fair income for his investment and labor. And uh, I uh, not only belong to NFO, but I also belong to other two other general farm organizations which I feel are striving uh, valiantly along uh, with you people to get what is right for the uh, corn and U.S. farmer. Uh, furthermore, I think uh, specifically as relates to NFO that uh, your organization uh, has a close dichotomy with our organization in that uh, we're both seeking to improve the marketing methods and stressing that. Uh, we, we in the action field uh, creating and uh, seeking out new markets and expanding them and you people working on the price side to uh, attempt to get a better price for the farmer. Yes, well, that's uh, fine. Uh, we, too, believe that uh, it's necessary for farm groups to work together. Uh, we believe that even though a farmer may belong to one or perhaps several other farm organizations, that really there's no basic conflict and no reason why all farmers should not join hands and join with the National Farmers Organization in attempting to band together and sell together to get a better price for farm commodities. And we're glad to see that other farm groups are taking the 
same view that we've held for a long time, and we're sure glad to have you as a member, and we're here to welcome all other groups and to let everyone know that just because they belong to some other farm organization it doesn't mean that they can't be good members of the National Farmers Organization and work with all the rest of us in trying to bring together enough of their total production so that we can bargain for cost of production plus reasonable profit prices for any and all farm commodities, not only the corn, which you represent, but also all other commodities which farmers produce in the United States. Uh, we don't ask uh, any farmer to desert any other organization to become a member of the National Farmers Organization. We welcome you and all other farmers to come and work with us in this common objective. Uh, you uh, mentioned in our remarks just prior to the time we started the program that you had recently come back from a round-the-world trip where you were investigating the possibilities of the corn market and uh, some other things that you were interested in. Would you care to tell us a little bit about your trip and, and what you observed as you traveled around? Well, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> mention that the trip had uh, two uh, basic uh, goals. One was to uh, assist the fine officers and staff that we have overseas in the uh, U.S. Feed Greens Council offices uh, in the work of expanding markets and uh, observing things which would help them to expand markets for U.S. corn. And the other was to go into some countries that were competitors of ours and are competitors of ours in raising corn for the world market to see what the real situation was there in the eyes of a farmer like myself and to try to analyze uh, what the probable future of their uh, continued production, expansion of production, and the penetration of world markets by these countries would be. Uh, the first uh, place that uh, we went to was in Japan, and of course at that level we were working with our very best corn customer of the U.S. Uh, the uh, necessity of uh, finding a new means of uh, beef production in Japan is uh, critical at the present time, and our work centered uh, on that and some other things. But uh, of great interest to us was Thailand, uh, which now is uh, uh, penetrating the Japanese market uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, they are uh, finding new means to clear the jungles of uh, Thailand and are putting out corn and cotton and some other crops, uh, field crops, but basically they're raising corn there and uh, shipping it to Japan. And Japan likes this because they found a new customer that they can trade sure. their manufactured products for. So uh, we wanted to see what was happening in Thailand and what would be the future uh, for their uh, expansion of corn production. Uh, I think that uh, we could just sum up uh, by saying that Thailand's cost of production on corn is much lower than ours in some respects because of the fact that their people are used to about $15 a month income, and if the wife works, she gets about $7.50 a month. And uh, we have to compare this to uh, the farmers of the United States that are expected to live in a country with the highest standard of living in the world and uh, uh, compete against these people at the same price level. Now, the farmers of Thailand are getting a dollar a bushel for corn, and we're getting about that same price here in the United States, and yet uh, one is at a very uh, close to subsistence level, and the other is on one of the highest standards of living. Uh, by contrast, uh, the next country uh, that I went to was in India. And, of course, there it's a matter of looking at uh, what uh, this country that's struggling to meet the needs of its people from a food standpoint is able to accomplish in the raising of corn. Yeah. Uh, India raises about uh, uh, as much corn acreage-wise as uh, the state of Illinois or the state of Iowa annually, and still their uh, average yield is only about 17 bushels per acre. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this that I won't go into now, but. They're struggling to, to bring their, their yields up, and they're doing some, uh, making some progress. But then going on, uh, did stop in Iran, and I won't comment on that, but uh, did go on to France, which is our third largest world exporter today. Uh, Thailand is the fourth largest. Uh, France is the uh, third largest exporter of feed grains uh, onto the world market. Uh, this may be a surprise to some people, 
but she's uh, next in line to Argentina, and then we come first. Mm -hmm. So as a real competitor and coming up fast with total uh, bushels uh, and increasing every year, I wanted to see what was causing this. And uh, I traveled with a representative of the U.S. Feed Greens Council in uh, France uh, from the Spanish border up to almost to the English Channel and saw uh, the modern methods which are used for the production of corn in France. And I think that the most important point is that the French government has recognized the fact that French farmers with the standard of living that is almost as high as ours cannot afford to take a dollar a bushel for corn. And they have protected them to the point that corn brings the farmer in France about $2.20 a bushel. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could have uh, even a uh, dollar and a half a bushel for our corn? It sure would. But they're getting 220, and so in, able to ex in order to be able to export onto the world market, the French government pays a what they call a restitution uh, on every bushel of corn of about 70 cents. And that lets that price down from 220 down to about the world level uh, over in Europe of a dollar and a half. In other words, it takes a dollar a bushel for our corn at the farm level, plus the transportation and other costs. Uh, added on to make a price of a dollar and a half uh, for France's co competition to us in Spain and in Germany and in Great Britain uh, will be uh, about equal to ours. So uh, there we have a, a country that uh, is uh, competing against us with the help of their government and retaining protection for the farmers in the country. Now, uh, maybe you want to make some comments uh, on this before I say what I, my conclusion would be of what I have Well, I, yes, I would. I'd just like to say that this uh, appears to put us in a rather awkward position, in a, in a rather difficult position, so far as world trade is concerned, as long as we try to buy and sell at the world trade level without any protection, as you say France, for example, is giving her farmers, it appears to me that uh, the, from what you've said, and of course from what I've read in other places, that the world situation in the commodity which you represent, corn, uh, is gradually becoming more and more competitive. And as these other nations which you have mentioned here, uh, in particular India and, and Thailand and, and some of the others, begin to apply modern techniques to corn raising, uh, we are be going, we are going to be in a even less favorable position to compete at a uh, world price than we have been up to now. As the world produces more and more corn, and particularly as we produce more and more corn, now this past year, for example, uh, our farmers in this country were encouraged to try to more or less pull out the stops and produce more uh, feed grains, corn and other feed grains, as well as wheat. Uh, seems that we responded well to this request, and now as a result, we find ourselves on a down market with receiving less price than we were even last year. Uh, the goal of the NFO, of course, is to try to get this corn price up to at least a dollar and a half a bushel along with uh, soybeans uh, at $3 and, and wheat at 2 uh, It seems to me that in order to accomplish some of the objectives which we are setting for ourselves and to get on a, a plane where we can have a satisfactory standard of living for uh, ourselves, farmers in this nation, we're going to have to consider the position of farmers in other nations as well. So I'm glad that you brought this up. Uh, I know that you have some suggestions where we've been trying to trade pretty much uh, on a free and open market all over the world. Uh, it appears to me that uh, with our production capabilities, we're headed for maybe more trouble in this field. What do you think? Well, I think that <clears throat> the uh, fact that uh, the last bushel of corn that's sold or the last few bushels of corn that's sold from any crop determines the price for practically all of it. In other words, uh, if we have uh, a certain amount of corn to be sold, uh, most of which is uh, utilized in the United States by either the livestock industry or the commercial industry, uh, the rest of it 
out here that has to go on to the world market and meet the world market price is the one that determines the price on the internally sold corn. And this internally sold corn is the corn price that determines what we're going to get for hogs and for cattle and for chickens and eggs and milk in the United States. So it has, the world price has a tremendous bearing upon our internal U.S. price. And uh, to me, uh, I cannot see that we can compete against South Africa, Argentina, Thailand, Indonesia, and France uh, at the present uh, methods of uh, operation and the uh, kind of standards of living that most of these countries have. Now, in the case of France, they have a standard of living on the French farms that I visited about equal to what the uh, Midwest corn farmer has. But in South Africa and in uh, Thailand and Indonesia, and also to some extent in uh, Argentina, which is another major competitor, the standards of living uh, and the demands upon the farmer are not as great from a dollars and cents standpoint. They don't educate their children to uh, a uh, high school graduation or college level. They don't have the taxes to uh, have to pay out to support all these things. Uh, they are operating in a different type of world of economy. So therefore, it uh, is apparent to me that the solution that we must look to uh, is one which will create a decent price for the products of the corn farmer or the end products that corn creates in the United States and then get this extra corn sold out on the world market, which the U.S. needs for uh, foreign exchange and the farmers need for a market for more acres of their land. Right. Now, uh, I uh, think that I told you at one time when we were conversing that there were four alternatives. And uh, three of these uh, have some uh, merit. Uh, one of them I don't think has any merit at all. But uh, uh, of the uh, four alternatives, uh, one of which is to just go along on the status quo and let these other countries keep on increasing their production and we having, as the only world corn producer, uh, continually shrinking our acres and our production in order to make room for them in the world market. Uh, this isn't good. So we got to th I think in terms of something else. Now, uh, we could have perhaps a world a grain agreement whereby uh, the countries of the world that are the producers get together and say we're going to divide this market up equally along, among each other or along a pattern of, of the past and then say that the price is going to be such and such. But this doesn't seem to have worked too well for us in the past on no. some other commodities. Not uh, where we tried it in the International Wheat Agreement. We got the dirty end of the stick each time. So yes. uh, we've uh, learned by practicality that this doesn't uh, lend itself to a, a reasonable solution. Now, the other two solutions uh, are fairly uh, helpful if they work with each other. One is an intensified world market development program for corn. But as we do this, we help the other countries too. And the fourth solution, which I think is uh, probably the one that we will have to come to at some time or another if we're going to stay in this world market, and that is a subsidized export for U.S. corn. Now, we did have this in the early 1960s in the uh, form of the payment in kind whereby we uh, paid out, uh, uh, as the expression goes, a baker's dozen. When we sold a dozen bushels of corn, why we gave a little more corn to the buyer without charging him for it. And this was taken out of U.S. Uh, government CCC stock. Now, we still have about 150 million bushels in CCC ownership stocks. Uh, I guess at the end of last month, it was 140 million bushels. Uh, this is uh, amply sufficient to carry on a payment in kind program for some time or there could be a subsidy applied uh, at the rate of uh, X number of cents per bushel. Let's take, for instance, uh, we'll say 15 cents a bushel. Well, if we would let our uh, corn compete in the world market at the market level of today, we could, by that means, raise our own internal price 15 cents a bushel and get 15 cents a bushel on approximately 4 billion bushels. Well, this is a terrific amount because this is the amount that we we uh, consume internally each year and uh, in the U.S. And 15 cents a bushel on that would be 600 million more bushels and uh, 600 million more dollars in the pocket of the uh, U.S. Uh, corn farmer and also in the beef cattle and hog and uh, poultry and dairymen. Well, of course, then what you're suggesting is really a, a two-price system, a system whereby we can get uh, a uh, fair price for our products that we use here at home in our country 
and then another price which we would use to export the needed whatever we need to in order to uh, get rid of the extra production which we come up with. And really be uh, very competitive, too, in the world market. Yes. Thereby. And, uh, of course, I believe that uh, you will probably agree that uh, there's no question but what we here in this country, without some sort of a program being worked out, uh, will be for at least quite a long time able to produce more corn than we have a use for here in our own nation. Now, what you're actually saying, seems to me, is uh, about the same as what the National Farmers Organization has been uh, recommending when we have told our people that what we thought we needed to do was to get together the producers of, in this case, corn, but you could use the same example for any commodity, get together enough of the total producers so that we can establish by a bargaining process a fair price cost of production plus a reasonable profit price for corn for that portion of the supply which is going to be used in this country. And then we'll have to assess ourselves so that we can export at a cheaper price. Now, of course, in the past, the only uh, export subsidy that has been available is through the government. And we in NFO uh, believe that we should always support any government program which would tend to put money into the pockets of farmers. But we do believe that in the final analysis to keep programs from changing from one administration to another, that it will be up to farmers to bring themselves together so that we can ourselves eventually handle this problem of exporting at a cheaper price. It appears to us, for example, that we would be much better off to sell our corn at a dollar and a half a bushel, what we could sell in this country for a dollar and a half, and then maybe only get a dollar for that portion that we had to export, but we would get a blend price of, say, a dollar and thirty, dollar and thirty-five, or forty cents a bushel for our corn. Yes. And of course, we frankly don't think a dollar and a half a bushel is enough for corn either, and I, I don't suppose you do. You were comparing it here to the price that the French receive of two dollars and twenty cents a bushel, uh, but. We believe that we should not corn alone, but all commodities, we should bring enough of the total together so that we will be able to get a good price, cost of production plus a reasonable profit price at least, on the corn that we use here in this country, and then have a two-price system so that we can dispose of whatever the overproduction may be. Well, I think you've made a real good uh, summary of uh, the thinking that uh, is basic to this problem. I do want to uh, say one or two things here, uh, taking ourselves back to an early portion of our discussion, and that is the fact that uh, we do need to have a control of the total production each year so that we don't come up with the sort of a situation we have right now, where we produce a little too much and as a result our position as farmers uh, is weakened as far as the selling price is concerned. Now, to me, uh, the uh, proper way of operating our uh, agricultural system in the U.S. is number one, to control the production, and number two, to sell on a market where we dictate the price. Today, we do have the tool for market control, or production control, I should say, we have the tool for production control in the voluntary feed grain program so far as corn and grain sorghum is concerned. Probably would be better if it was a mandatory situation because all farmers would be then sharing in the load of uh, producing within the realm of what was the probability of what we needed in the way of total production. But be that as it may, we have this voluntary feed grain program which enables farmers generally to adjust each year to about what the need is going to be. The second thing that we need then is to be able to say what we think the price should be at the time that is marketed. So we, right. have, so we have one tool at hand, and we should be following that out as strongly as possible. And National Corn Growers Association uh, has the policy of urging every farmer this coming year to participate in the feed grain program in order to tighten up this supply situation, which is too great at the present time. Mm -hmm. And we need to create this, this situation of bringing uh, production in line, and you people are working on the sales side, you see. Right. You're working on right. the marketing side right. to 
to get the say-so developed eventually so that you can name and we can name together the price that this uh, product should bring at a reasonable level for, for agriculture. And I'm glad to say that uh, we are making progress. Uh, we are working, as you say, in an effort to raise the price of these products. We are very gratified in the last uh, few weeks at the type of farmers that have that are being attracted, shall I say, to our proposals and to our program. Uh, farmers such as yourself that uh, have large operations and that are influential farmers more and more seem to be attracted toward what we're trying to propose. Just uh, last week, uh, Mr. Stoddard, who's the public relations uh, director for the Farm Quarterly magazine, has a large farming operation in Wyoming, some 24,000 acres. He was in our office last week and signed a membership application, became a member of the National Farmers Organization. Just last week, for example, uh, down in the state of Kansas, uh, what is reported to be the second largest farmer in the state joined the National Farmers Organization at one of our organizational meetings. And this is going on all around over the nation. It seems that we are attracting many, many farmers because of the fact that uh, there is such a tremendous interest in NFO at this time. We have decided to, well, shall I say, make it easier for farmers to become members of the National Farmers Organization. Uh, just recently, we have decided that what we should do is appeal to the farmers that uh, have been interested in our program, but uh, we haven't been able to get out and contact directly to write and send their membership direct to our national office or to the radio station to which they're listening at this program. So at this stage, I would like to appeal to all of you farmers that are listening to this program tonight to fill out your check to the National Farmers Organization or just plain NFO in the amount of $25, uh, right over in the corner, first year membership dues, sign your check and either mail it to this station or address your envelope to membership NFO Corning, Iowa. And come on and join the effort so that you may actually become a part of what we're trying to accomplish. Again, I'd like to say, Mr. Gappinger, that we're very happy to have had you on our program this evening, and uh, I'm sure that you will be a big help to the National Farmers Organization in the months ahead. And of course, we say to you, as we say to every member who joins, we welcome you, we appreciate your support, uh, anything that you can do to assist in convincing other farmers, your neighbors back home, anyone that you contact, uh, we would appreciate any help that we can get in bringing together enough farmers to accomplish this objective. Well, I think our two organizations are well coordinated for the job. Thank you. U.S. Farm Report has presented Marketing Agency in Common with Gordon Schaefer, Chief Negotiator of the National Farmers Organization, and Walter Geppinger, President of the National Corn Growers Association. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more information on agriculture and rural America, which is a gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The National Farmers Organization, pioneer of collective bargaining, and the organization devoting its time, efforts, and resources to the preservation of the family farm structure and private enterprise in America. Thank you.